is happening investors? It is your boy Jack. I am not a financial advisor and this is probably the most exciting video I have ever had the pleasure of recording in my YouTube career. I'm going to keep this intro really short and sweet but essentially we have the CFO of Workhorse on for an interview today, Steve Schrader. I must say he was an absolute gentleman of a man and there is so much useful information in this video. Make sure to watch it till the end. Please smash that like button for me right now guys. I would appreciate it so much. I went through a lot of effort preparing this interview and getting it in the works in the first place. I would really appreciate that that like please subscribe if you're new around here we speak about workhorse weekly and please do drop me a comment down below let me know what you think of the interview if there's anything you took from this that was helpful and please do show steve some love in the comment section for taking time out of his very busy schedule to speak with us with that being said guys here is the video hello everybody thank you all very much for tuning in today as you can see on the screen i have a very special guest we have the cfo of our favorite company on this channel workhorse steve schrader steve it is absolutely amazing to have you thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to do this thanks jack i'm happy to do it and glad to uh, meet you me too me too so much well steve to start things off before we get into workhorse i just want to know a little bit more about you i've done all of the digging that i can um i know you've been a cfo for more than 16 years now and i'm wondering what has drawn you to workhorse at this stage of your career I think it actually was, so my, my last job was in manufacturing as well. Um, it was in, in uh, auto glass manufacturing. So I think it was the manufacturing. Uh, I think it was the last delivery mile segment of it that was interesting to me. And, and it was their positioning. I think that I saw from a standpoint of a company that was really standing alone, kind of doing things on the, in the last mile delivery with the delivery trucks, you know, different sizes, 1,000 cubic feet, 650, 450. Um, that interest um, a lot of different players out there, almost every single delivery van you see going in, in, uh, around in neighborhoods. And then I think on top of that, they had the drone that was mounted to the truck, which I think was really cool. Yes. And I think they were on the, you know, just on the kind of the mountaintop ready to kind of go over and actually start production, which, you know, again, working for a manufacturing company, I kind of had been through that before too. So it was, it was all very exciting, I think, where they were at. Cool. No, very cool. And I think that's a lot of the reason why a lot of us investors have gotten so excited is because of the stage of life that the company is in right now. It's right. like, you know, people who saw the vision years and years ago, lucky, but now to an extent, it's all starting to come to fruition. You know what I mean? Exactly. Okay. All right. I'm going to start getting into some of the questions that people want. Okay. So for me personally, one of the main things I really want to know a lot more about is how helpful will the HVIP incentive launched by CAR be towards Workhorse? Because I know, I believe they're now eligible for a monetary voucher of up to about $50,000 on each of the C1000s at least. I'm not sure exactly how much a C1000 is, but we can make a guess from what came out in the Q2 earnings. And to me, it seems like this could be absolutely massive in regards to hitting the production targets that you guys have set out for yourselves for the next two quarters of this year. I'm just wondering how important is this going to be going forward? Oh, I think it's really helpful in California and in any other state would kind of offer an incentive like that. Um, I won't get into kind of how much that is of the price, but it's yeah. that 50000 is substantial. Yeah. And, and even though right now we have a, a little bit higher cost than what a turn of combustion um, competition would be, our lifetime savings are huge. Yes. You know, basically uh, on a UPS truck, a FedEx truck, those um, drive 300,000 miles and spend $300,000 on fuel and maintenance. Yes. And we can do the same thing for about 130000 because basically, you know. It is, um, it is insane. That is, I think, what's gotten a lot of people on CWV. And I think that's why one of the things I bring up in a lot of my videos in the past was ARC Invest and Disruptive Innovation ETF getting behind you guys in particular. And, you know, they don't have any other up-and-coming EV-related vehicles in there whatsoever. And I think a lot of people have a lot of respect for ARC in, in their portfolios as of right now. A lot of people look up to them. And I just think that... Seeing them believe in you guys, they just added another over 50,000 shares in the last two days, I think. I think once Q2 earnings came out, they added just right. under 47,000. And I think, especially right. with the day we saw then, a lot of people were worried about the red day. Well, I think that reaffirmed a lot of our thoughts already when we see a company like ARC get involved there. I agree. And I think uh, what ARC sees is what you know everybody else is seeing is fleet managers at the end of the day, they look for cost savings, right? That's Six what they're going to be judged on and being efficient. And I think because, you know, we can do instead of a dollar per mile that they're currently doing, we do for 40 cents a mile. And if you use the drone, you can do it for four cents a mile. So I think at the end of the day, the savings that we can kind of bring to them is huge. And that's even, you know, that those, when I say 40 cents a mile, that's considering that you have to pay a little bit more upfront for the car 
or for the truck, I'm sorry, the vehicle. And then also um, you have to pay for two battery replacements and you have to, have to pay for infrastructure. Even after all that, you still save all that money. Um, so I think adding $50,000 to the actual, get the price below uh, the internal combustion yes. uh, vehicles is huge. Yeah, it has to be. It has to be considering that, as you just said, over the span of even a few years, it's going to end up saving you a whole lot of money. And then there's just one more thing in regards to CARB, okay? In the Q2 earnings, it was announced that Workhorse would be receiving one and a half carbon emission credits through every vehicle sold that are worth about $200, $300 each. Will this be of significance in regards to, you know, posting better quarterly earnings going forwards, or will this not be too important until, you know, production is ramped up quite considerably? I think more when production's wrapped up more considerably and, and also has to go to the states that actually offer, offer the car credits. Okay. So it's not going to be anything like Tesla, you know, yeah. or, you know, a portion of their earnings are uh, that's, car credit. That's what but I thought. Our, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, but from our standpoint, it's, it's a helpful to kind of have that uh, revenue stream as well. And, and you know, especially as we do start delivering to a lot of these states. Yeah. And it's just one more kind of forward looking thing that, you know, just Correct. threatens the long term outlook, 100%. Okay, so that's great. That's what I really want to hear about the HVIP incentive. One thing I'd really like to know, because I don't think there's the most information on it in the world out there, is a little bit about more of the strategic alliance with Duke Energy. As I know, you also worked with Duke for a very considerable period of time. How exactly are they going to help Workhorse in ramping up production and ultimately, again, meeting that expectation of the 300 or 400 delivery vehicles delivered by the end of the year? So I think what Duke helps us is, is more from a standpoint of customers come to us that are interested in the truck. They see the savings opportunities, but they have to also consider the infrastructure side of it. Yeah. And so we can turn them to the biggest utility in the U.S. and say, you know, Duke can help you um, from a standpoint of what charging infrastructure you need, what utility work you need. Um, and the same thing that comes from Duke's side is they can kind of turn customers to us. Um, and I think, you know, Duke also reaches so many different fleet customers when you think about it, yeah. you know, they have connections everywhere. So I think just anything that they would hear from a standpoint of uh, customers that are interested in electric vehicles, I think is going to be helpful to us as well. Yeah, so yeah, well, I think we're real excited about the Duke relationship. And just to let you know, you kind of asked about my history. I worked for 20 years in the utility industry and I worked for the utilities that actually folded up into Duke, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, Very cool. Very actually. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. Okay. Um, and then we'll stay on the, the concept of cash for a little while. And there's a quote from you in the Q2 earnings. We currently have $10.5 million of cash available. We believe that this will allow us to ramp up production to hit our target level this year, fund next year's operations, as well as take us into 2020 before we need additional financing. And I know the cash position is what I've been getting asked about a considerable amount in my comment section. I think I'm confident in what you're saying. I'm wondering is, you know, that 10 and a half million, is that because of a lot of what we've already spoken about is going to come into play? Or is there anything else that really needs to be taken into consideration? It's actually 105 million. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I wrote things. I, I wrote just missed a decimal there. Yeah, you know, I wrote that down very wrong. But, wrote down very and, wrong. and actually, we feel it can take us into 2022. Okay. I think the things to think about in consideration of that would be if we got a substantial contract or order um, but with kind of the current orders or even some, you know, orders that we get in the future. I think it'd have to be a pretty substantial order that would say, well, maybe we need a little bit more. Yes. Um, or if we look at our balance sheet right now, we look at some of the things that are higher cost capital. If we just wanted to kind of replace some of the higher cost capital with cheaper capital, that would be an, an option too. But normal kind of, uh, Working capital uh, and the current kind of production we have and, and backlog and kind of getting through that, I think we're fine and, and it should be able to get us uh, through 20, you know, into 2022. 100%. 100%. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. And then you went ahead and we hired a lot more employees lately, wasn't it? I saw in the Q2 earnings, I believe you went up to something in the realms of 115 new employees. Are they predominantly, if you're able to speak about it, in the realms of engineers and like production lines? Yeah, that's exactly what they are. Engineers, assembly group. Okay. When you think about the assembly for what we have, it's not um, like a traditional production line, as you would see. Yeah. It'd be more like sub-assembly areas okay. that we would kind of put the car together in different, uh, put the truck together in different um, portions. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, we're hiring from them and definitely from an engineering standpoint, we're hiring. Cool. And that is then where, because the research and development expenses increased to 1.6 million from 1.2, I think. So that is mainly what's happening there. Right. And we're also trying to think, you know, from an engineering standpoint, what's the next, uh, what's the next design down the road? And from our standpoint, we're getting a lot of calls about refrigeration. Okay. Very now, interesting. A lot of, you know, almost everybody that has refrigeration or would want that, you know, 
Walmart's got groceries, Amazon's got Whole Foods groceries, Kroger's. I mean, uh, we get all kinds of questions. Can you do refrigeration? And we can. Um, yes. And we're going to get a prototype starting on that. So it's not only just engineering and production engineering right now to get to kind of our three to 400 this year uh, in the fourth quarter, but also thinking about what we're going to do next. Very, very interesting. Because that was actually one of the questions I was going to ask a little bit later on was in regards to, do you plan on expanding out ever from last mile delivery? But even that is an expansion from the sector that you're already in. You know, it'll then be refrigerated last mile delivery. That's very interesting. Um, that's still last mile delivery, you know, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, what they do. And I think that that market for us is a huge market. It's an $18 billion market, you know, from a standpoint of the UPS, it's FedEx, it's DHLs, but also think about the Mercedes Sprinters, the Ram Pro Masters, and the Ford Transits that you see right now doing delivery as well. We have the electric version of that in our C450 and C650. Yeah. Um, and, and so if you didn't want the big C1000 cubic feet truck that UPS might use or FedEx, you can certainly get a smaller truck and we think those will compete very well. We already talked about kind of the fuel savings and, you know, the maintenance, you know, you don't have a transmission, you yeah. know, that you're not really beating up a transmission and paying for that every, yeah. every year. That's, that's cool. That's really, it's really cool to hear that coming from you guys that you guys are still looking forward to, you know, that's something we always obviously really want to see. And I suppose in the same breath, the same nature, a question on drones, which we already briefly touched on. But do you think that they're going to offer workhorse a, a quite a substantial strategic and financial advantage over competitors? Because I think a lot of people are underestimating the power of these drones and the thoughts of, as you said earlier, being able to deliver at, say, four cents as opposed to a dollar, whatever it is for your standard ICE vehicle, and potentially having the capabilities to do two deliveries at once if they're launching off the, the vehicle. Do you think that they're actually going to offer a, a, a very large advantage in the future? We do. Uh, I think from our standpoint, we may have uh, underestimated ourselves. I think in, even last year, I would say for the most part, we probably thought drones were a way to kind of, and the truck mounted drone that we had was a way to help sell more trucks. Yeah. And then the pandemic comes about and all of a sudden exponentially, people are interested in our drone and the drone from a standpoint of last mile delivery. Um, and I think too, I think it's, it's worth noting we were in April, we were invited down um, by UPS and, and with uh, another company that uh, they also invited down called Drone Up was in Virginia. And we went to Virginia and in front of government administration officials, what they wanted to do was see how drones could react from a standpoint of different missions that would help from a medical and emergency standpoint. And just to give you some perspective, our drone, uh, well, uh, let me talk, Drone Up, I just had three people operating their drone. Okay. We had a drone that took off autonomously from the top of the truck, dropped the package off and came back to the truck um, and via software and stuff. So I think that impressed a lot of people. And I think people, I think from a standpoint of customers looking at that from a standpoint of what that can do for last mile delivery, like I said, costs four cents a mile to do, use a drone. And you picture just like you said, as a driver turning left and before he turns left, he had put the package in the, the little carriage inside, pushes a button, drone takes off, dr takes the package the opposite way comes back to the truck wherever it's at. Yeah. So we're excited about the drone too. And there is an opportunity too. Now to use it long-term and commercially, you have to go to the FAA and get a type certification and production certification. That does take about 12 to 18 months. But there is a, a strong business case that could be just as lucrative on the truck side, on the drone side, to actually be an, a drone OEM if we wanted to as well. So we're excited about it. Yeah, no, cool. That was something I just really wanted to get your thoughts on because, again, that's something that really excites me as an investor is the potential of those drones becoming a very integral part of the business in the future. And um, speaking of the drones, obviously, they're autonomous. I'm wondering if you guys are working on any autonomous aspect to the delivery vehicles or if that's something that wouldn't even be useful in last mile delivery, just because I know it's something that people are always speaking about in regards to EV in general. I'm wondering if it's something that you guys are considering or if you're going down that route at all. Now we're considering it too. It's not something that we would probably de develop on our own. I think you can buy off the shelf products, uh, but think about it from a standpoint of autonomous, autonomous of just, uh, you can use a mailbox, for example, to kind of, uh, as a guide from a standpoint of a, as something that would be a, a marker and that could stop the truck or that you're using. So okay. I think it's uses from a standpoint of how you, you think about that, uh, but autonomously kind of just looking, putting that on the on the truck, again, kind of like refrigeration, it's kind of one of the next things down the road of how can you do that and how can you best do that? How can you safely do that? Yeah, 100%. That sounds cool. That sounds cool. And then one thing, a little bit in regards to lower style motors. 
Do you guys, because obviously you guys have your own plant, it's a fairly massive plant for the stage we're at right now. Do you plan on ever having to outsource to Lordstown Motors in order to hit production targets? Or would that not even really have to be a thought process as of right now? Well, I, I, would, I wouldn't use the word we'd have to. I would say it's a great option for us. So like you said, Union City, Indiana, our factory right there, that used to put out 60,000 chassis in the Navistar days and stuff like that. So it, has, it can do probably a very similar amount from the standpoint of truck. I think uh, what we would look at um, would be, would we have to spend capital to maybe automate it a little bit more to get to the volumes eventually we want to be? Yes. And if, if there's a facility like Lordstown, which we think is a great strategic partner, um, and also that we own 10% of, um, that you know, if their SPAC goes through and closes in the fourth quarter, it might be worth $160 million. Yes. But they also have a 6 million square foot plant. And to accommodate some of the volumes we have would be kind of a drop in the bucket. And, if, and certainly, if they could do it for lower cost um, and, and no capital spending or very little capital spending, that's something we'd have to look at. So that's just, as of right now, it's a consideration. And obviously, all, as, from, the, from the perspective of a CFO, of course, it all comes down to the financial aspects of things. It is. And we always, but as a CFO, too, you always like to have options. Yeah. And yeah, so we, we're happy that that's a great option for us. Cool. And again, on Lordstown Motors, obviously very exciting that they are going public with Diamond Peak. Do you think that will, yet again, just through Lordstown going public, and obviously you guys own a 10%, just put Workhorse in an even better financial position, hopefully, as you said, if it goes through by Q4 by the end of this year or going into next year? Well, I believe so, because I think if, if they do, you know, at the $1.6 billion valuation they have and only 10%, that does give you a $160 million asset at least probably on the books. I mean, you know, it'll be a public company. I guess we'll see what it does after it uh, actually closes. But, um, and that gives you $160 million uh, basset on there that would eventually be liquid fairly quickly too, you know? So I think, uh, yeah, that's exciting. I think you, you can do a lot of, it gives you, a lot, again, it gives you a lot of options yeah. from the standpoint of, you know, having that uh, asset on your balance sheet. Yeah, okay, cool. Excellent, excellent. Um, that's the large majority of what I want to ask. Obviously, the comment section is going to be filled with one question and one question only. Is there any update on the USPS contract? Well, you, we can't say anything, you know, so I have to say no comment. Yeah. Um, the only thing I will say is, I, I, at least we read too, I think it was a couple of days ago, trucks.com, talked to the, UP, you know, the post office themselves and talked to yeah. post office employees. So I think they had some data, at least it's probably at least the latest thinking of the post office. Okay, cool. But from our standpoint, we can't comment. Perfect. No, I, I appreciate that. And I'll make sure I have that article linked in the description below if you guys do want to read it. And I probably will cover it in whatever my next workhorse video is. We know they're not very far between. And Steve, I suppose, lastly, thank you so much for everything. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the viewers? Anything else you think that they should be aware of that I perhaps haven't asked you about today? I think we probably talked about uh, all the things. Um, or And we just had earnings release, so I think we put a lot of information out there from that standpoint. I'm happy to talk to your viewers. And, and I think, like I said, I've I've watched some of your videos and I like how excited you're about the company. We're excited about the company too. So uh, thank no, you for having us. That's perfect, Steve. Again, I appreciate your time so much. I'm sure a lot of people will take something from this video. And that is it. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it. Thanks. So guys, some really exciting information actually came out of that video. I must say that personally, I thoroughly enjoyed recording that. Steve was a professional, he came across so well, and I was very nervous recording this, I won't lie, I'm not used to doing things live, I'm not used to not editing, I'm not used to being an interviewer at all, and he made it so easy on me. Recording this today has only reaffirmed my confidence in Workhorse. The fact that their CFO was willing to take time out of his day to speak to some YouTuber and his audience says a lot about a person. And again, this video did take me a very long time to prepare, so if you have watched until the end and you did enjoy, please do hit that like button, Drop me a comment and subscribe if you're new because all of those things genuinely help me out so much and will encourage me to continue doing things like this in the future. If you have anybody else you'd like me to try to get on for an interview as well, drop it in the comment section. I will keep doing them if we get a good response. With all of that being said, I hope you all have an absolutely fantastic day. I will see you for the next video. Peace.